On today's Retro Tech Repair, we're going to be trying to fix this Sony laser displayer that I bought spares or repair on eBay. Yeah, a bit of an interesting one, this. This is a Sony MDP650. It's a PAL and NTSC CD and video disc or laser disc player. So hopefully you're familiar with laser disc as a format. It's a 12 inch optical disc about the size of an LP, but looks much more like a CD. Unlike a CD or a DVD, the video image is encoded onto the disc as an analog signal. This means that a PAL or NTSC composite signal is about the best that you're going to get from one of these players. Later players like this could decode a Dolby Digital signal too. So some discs do have Dolby Digital, and this particular player has an optical out, so you can connect that digital signal directly to your AV amplifier. So let's take a quick look at the eBay listing for this one. Sony MDP 650D laser disc player. I paid £87 plus £20 shipping. And here is the seller's description. Sony MDP 650D laser disc player. Condition is for parts not working. Dispatch Royal Mail second class. And then he added the note. Powers up and automatically ejects disc. So sold as spares. So let's take a look and see how it behaves when we power it up. So apologies for the weird camera angles on this one. This thing is just too big to fit on my desk or bench where I do my repairs. So I have this camera kind of set up, hopefully, just to demonstrate what happens when I try and turn this thing on. So at the moment, it doesn't have a disc in it. It's connected up to the TV. Uh, it's not connected up to the mains power. So we'll switch on the mains power right now. We'll see what happens. And that's it. It just sits there, opens the drawer, and makes a buzzing noise. I can't close the drawer. It doesn't respond to the remote control, doesn't put an image on the screen. So yeah, just as the seller described really, we're gonna have to take a look inside this one by the looks of things. Okay, so not much to see in here. A few kind of, uh, if that's a burn mark there, that's interesting. Uh, maybe just be dust accumulation. Not much we can see from inside here. I don't think there's going to be much we can learn. And the tray, will, yeah, the tray just pulls out. But what I do notice is, in fact, it looks like there is a crack in our kind of runner here. I don't know how significant that is. As the laser starts to move up and down, I fear it might be quite significant. Uh, but we're not at the point where the laser's moving up and down yet, I don't think. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to see much from this angle. So we're going to flip it over and see what's in the other side. So let's take a look if we can see anything from underneath. All right, well, clearly there's quite a lot going on in here. We have some kind of main board here, MP701. Then we have a second board, which probably is a motor drive board or something, I'm guessing. Not sure exactly. Laser drive, maybe, because it looks like the motor connects directly to this board. And this board has a number of electrolytic capacitors on, but they all look fine. Looks like maybe this is a kind of voltage regulator or a voltage conversion board. And then we have a kind of mains AC transformer, which also has another smaller transformer on there as well. Uh, a couple of fuses on the face of it, they look to be intact, but I'll take a quick look at that. And uh, we'll take it from there, really, start making some voltage measurements and see what we find. So I noticed there is a little reset switch on here. It's one of those that you kind of hit with a paper clip. Oh dear, bits of plastic are falling out of this. That isn't good. Um, yeah, no, that's not good at all. Um, but there is a little reset switch there, so I think I might try and power it up again and just press that. A bit of a long shot, you know, never hurts to try, does it? Our oh, reset switch is hidden away in here, so I'm going to power it up. The tray probably will come out, and I'll see if I can hit that reset switch. So I did power it up, the tray did come out, I did hit the reset switch, and it made no difference whatsoever. I was lucky, there is a service manual available for this online, so I've downloaded that. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a troubleshooting section. It just tells you test points and some things that you could measure. It will have some voltage measurements on, so the first thing we're going to do is try and take some voltage measurements off the power supply and see if the rest of the circuits are getting the voltages that they expect. 
So I set about measuring the various voltages from the power supply board using my multimeter and with reference to the circuit diagram that I'd downloaded. Now this took me quite a long time because there are multiple connectors from the power supply board and each of the connectors carries multiple voltages, AC and DC, different voltage levels, positive and negative. These then go off to the various components of the board, printed circuit assemblies, motors and sensors and so on. I suppose the good news is that all of the voltage levels seemed correct. The bad news is, of course, that I'm no closer to finding out what's wrong with our laser disc player. So since the player doesn't respond to any of the buttons, and it doesn't respond to the on-off switch, I decided that was where I was going to go next. I have this unplugged now, as we can see, and I'm going to try and work out how to get this front cover off, and as you can probably tell, I have close to no room on my desk, Oop, on my desk here to do that. And, these plastics are just so brittle. I've broken another piece off. Look, every time I pick it up, something like this happens. It really is not in great shape. And that's a bit of a shame because that piece is probably going to be visible uh, when we put everything back together. But I am collecting them all up in a little jar of screws and broken bits of plastic. Yeah, I'm probably just going to pause the cameras a second and just see if I can figure out how to get this off. So I just realized that in taking these off, I broke the plastic tabs on both of these connectors here on the front panel. So and I have some more plastic pieces to put in my collection of plastic bits. I'm just going to try and now get the final piece of plastics off the front. And there it comes. And all I can really see at this point are the switches. It's like if there is active circuitry, and I think there is, it's on the rear of this board. So I've got another piece of broken plastic in the process of taking the front panel off here. I'll pop that in the jar. Come on, mate. I'm sorry to disturb you, but you, uh, you need to get out of the way so I can repair this. No. Oh dear. So a little bit more time has passed. In fact, it's the next day now, and I finally have this board free of all the kind of uh, mechanical strain relief things, cable management in the back. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to remove the connectors from it. We'll take a good visual look at the board, and uh, it'll give us a chance to exercise these connectors in case they've maybe had some oxidization over time, and an opportunity to, to look at this printed circuit assembly and see if there's anything that's obvious going on with it. Okay, so here is our display board. It looks like that maybe two boards. This presumably is the infrared receiver. And then over here, all of the buttons, obviously. This kind of rotary control that we have here, the two, three connectors we talked about before, VFD display. Uh, so we'll pop that aside a second. We'll go ahead and clean these connectors up in a minute. But first of all, I just want to inspect this board visually for... Uh, potential soldering issues or something like that. So I'm just going to take a moment. I'm going to go over it with a magnifier and I'll come back to you if I find anything. Okay, so the good news is I did find a couple of solder joints there that appear to have cracked. That's actually really good news because to be honest, this was a bit out of my capability. I wasn't sure whether I'd be able to get anywhere with this. So finding something like that is a, is a big thing. Anyway, I did find a couple of solder joints that were cracked. I'm going to try and show you those. I also took a um, still image of them and I'll cut that into the video. There are two fairly large solder joints. That's one of them there. And then the other one is over here. They have a crack all the way around. These are the ones for here, which presumably is when you kind of press on the buttons on the front. And those appear to have cracked on both. Now, I don't know if it's significant or not, but certainly they are defective. So I'm going to solder those up. So I had to put quite a lot of heat into those connectors to get them to reflow, but eventually I did. And whilst I had the iron out, I decided I was going to reflow a number of other connections on the back of the printed circuit assembly. I also decided to clean the connectors with some IPA. And when I assemble those to the wiring loom, I'll exercise each in turn a little bit to try and work off any oxidization that might have built up over time. Let's plug this in and see if anything has changed. Here goes. Yes, yes, something has changed. The display has come up. Now the draw still ejected, but I don't know if you can see that, but the display now has come up here. Uh, let me dim the lights. All right, so now hopefully you can see that. The display is here, it's flashing close. The tray opened automatically. Uh, we have the on-off switch here, see if that works. No, oh, it makes a noise. 
but the constant kind of whirring has gone and the display is now functioning. So after some experimentation, it looked like I could press open or closed on the front panel and have the display indicate whether I had opened or closed the tray, but the tray itself didn't move. Now the on off button worked in a similar kind of way, so I press on or off and the display would say off, but in fact, the machine would stay powered up. Nonetheless, I decided it was worth trying a disc. Yeah, nothing at all on the display, but it does say close. So irrespective of what position it's in, it seems to think that it's closed. If I zoom out here, hopefully you can see that on the display, or you can still see it there. It's just flashing closed. So although it's closed, it doesn't seem to know it is. I think that's my next mission. So at this point, since it looked to me like the display board didn't know whether the tray was open or not, I decided to investigate the open and close switches for the tray. So I have here an excerpt from the maintenance manual, and there is a tray open close switch, which is situated apparently here. So I'm guessing I'm going to get the tray off to take a look at that. But that tray switch actually goes then to another switch, which is the 707 board. So this signal needs to be good here and good here in order for the microprocessor to even know about it. So I need to look for this 707 board as well. And according to this diagram, the tray switch is here, which I think is kind of around here somewhere. And then the 707 is described as the chuck switch. And that seems to be about here. So I think the thing for me to do now is to take off these two panels. Now I've got to be careful with these because this is quite a lot of weight. It's getting ever more flimsy the more of these strengthening panels I take off. The plastics are cracking. It's already started to crack here. In fact, the screw ross has broken there already. Uh, there are bits of plastic everywhere. I have to be really careful with that. So I'm going to power it down, take these two metal strengtheners off, try and take maybe the tray out and see if I can find those two switches. Now, I think I need to be careful not to physically move this when these parts are out of the way because uh, it will have lost almost all of its rigidity at this point. This screw boss is already damaged, I think, and that's already loose. So we'll take this screw out next. Oh, another one cracked. I can't believe it. Every time I try and move a piece of plastic, it just breaks. It's a real nuisance. As you can see, the screw boss here is already broken as well. And this is a fairly significant part. This is holding the disc in place. I, uh, I just hope there's going to be enough to hold everything together when I've been through this process. Anyway, here we are. Let's see if we can get the tray out now. Of course, it's reluctant to come when it's not powered up. So maybe we power it up first. Okay. Well, we certainly have a much better view of things than we had before. I wonder if at this point now I can remove the tray. Okay, the tray just lifts straight out. Now that strengthening panel is gone, which is quite convenient. It looks like this is one of the switches that we were after, and maybe this is the other. So these are the two things I'm going to try and clean up now. I worry we might be reaching the end of the road with this. I think what's happening is it's not completing the insert of the tray correctly, and that is resulting in it then can say, no, well, I've not closed the tray properly, so I'm going to eject the tray. Here's the tray close switch. That seems to be okay. And here is the other switch, which is the kind of location of this, um, if you like, uh, chassis, I suppose. The, I'm not sure if it has a name, the thing which carries the laser up and down. So what would happen is the disc comes in, this comes up, lifts the disc off the tray, and it can spin the disc. Now, what seems to be happening is these cogs here come some way and then the motor carries on spinning and there's another cog underneath here which is supposed to be pulling this mechanism forward and lifting up this metal piece in the middle but it's not able to do that and this just spins so i'll plug it in now and hopefully well hopefully it'll do it again but we'll see okay so let me just switch it on and see what happens oops well that obviously didn't help what's happening now is this motor is spinning, trying to eject this tray, but the belt's just slipping on this cog because there's too much resistance here. Now, I could just try replacing that belt, but when I try and move the cog by hand, it still will go some of the way, but then when it gets to the point where it needs to lift this mechanism, it just can't. I mean, it's so stiff there. So I don't want to put too much pressure on that. 
what I want to try and do is take a look and see what I can do to maybe lubricate this or something or make it easier to lift. The problem with that is that it's supposed to have these plastic clips which are holding it, this kind of sliding piece in place and one of them is already broken and the rest are really brittle. So I'm worried that if I go too much further with this I'm going to end up just snapping these pieces. But I am going to try and remove the wheels and see if I can lubricate some of this and get it to move freely without making things too much worse than they already are. It's worth a chance. It doesn't work at the moment, so we'll give it a go. So I'm going to start by just taking off this cog here. It's a little clip holding it in place. And there are some features underneath that which we need to retain in roughly the, well probably exactly the same position actually, not roughly the same position. And then this hopefully can lift out too. But I'm curious to see now if we can move this mechanism Alright, well there seems to be a stop here, so what's happening is that stop is actually a piece of broken plastic that's wedged in the mechanism here. So I'm not quite sure where that came from. But that's probably what was stopping us moving the sled across, so hopefully now... Yeah, there we are. Alright, so there's a little plastic piece that are broken off, kind of wedged in the mechanism there. I'm going to lubricate some of this up. Uh, change that belt, put everything back together, now we've got that broken plastic piece out from wherever it was it came, and, uh, and reassemble it. Unfortunately though, I did notice where this piece that was wedged in here had come from, and it came from here, and I actually have the other piece that goes here as well, presumably there's some kind of stop for the tray, but I noticed there's this huge crack starting here, all the way down the plastic, goes all the way around here, and all the way around here. I don't know how critical that is, but this is the piece that comes across, that comes up and connects with the top of the disc. So I'm not hugely optimistic that I'm going to be able to repair this. But um, yeah, well, we'll keep trying. All right, so I got this grease. I don't know if it's any good or not. Just got it from Amazon. It's supposed to be plastic safe. So I'm just going to use that to grease everywhere that I can see where this kind of chassis moves. So I greased all the sliding components and replaced the belt with one that I bought off eBay. I also greased and reinstalled the gears on the spindle. Now there is a specific orientation that these gears need to go in and this is explained in the service manual. But the service manual explains it so much better than I can that I'm not going to attempt to explain it here. The manual can be downloaded online. I also took the opportunity to clean the tray close switch and the chuck position switch using some electrical contact cleaner. So I think the thing for me to do now is to slide the tray back in. Hopefully uh, when I do that, it'll catch on these cogs and put those back where they need to be. And then we'll probably do a couple of power resets and, uh, and we'll see what's happening. See, it's now engaging on these wheels as it goes in. I couldn't find anything in the maintenance manual about how to install this. So I'm, I'm just, just hoping that's it. Let's put some power to it and see what happens. Okay, that's great. At least we've seen some action on the center sled now. I wonder if open and close works. Well, it's slow. And it falls out at the end. And it's all gone horribly wrong. I think the problem was that I didn't have this kind of stop in place. My guess is that normally the tray would hit this and then the motor would just kind of stop, wouldn't be able to go any further, and then it would close down. That obviously didn't happen because this wasn't in place. So uh, I'm going to try and get our gears back where they're supposed to be, get this stop in place, and, and try that again. And try it again I did several times, time and time and time again. But I never recreated the success I'd had with that first attempt. So honestly, I gave up. I put it back together with the intention of selling it back on eBay, and then I thought, no, I'm not going to give up, and I kept on trying. So I decided the next thing to do was to try the connections between the front panel and the main printed circuit assembly and see if they were sound. Okay, so I got a circuit diagram of this board. Initially when I switched the power to the board, or power to the unit, it just kind of spanned the load motor, tray motor a few times, and the display didn't come up, and then I was just sitting here looking at it, and the display came up. So I started to suspect, based on this, that there was some problem with communications between the front panel printed circuit assembly and the main board. So I set about measuring connectivity between the connectors of the board and the connectors of the printed circuit assembly within the base unit, and I also checked the voltages. None of this led me anywhere. All right, so I took a circuit board here, and I traced through all of the connections 
from the connector coming in, at least to the first point of contact. A lot of them connect straight to this processor here, so I was able to just to connect those together. I just did that with the meter on continuity test. I also noticed that there were a number of test points and voltages marked on the schematic, so I tested those as well. But again, no luck. So, yeah, I'm really not quite sure where to go. I'm starting to think that perhaps this board, although we'd know it's only working intermittently, is probably good. So next up for scrutiny is the main printed circuit assembly within the player itself. It's a double-sided printed circuit board and it has two daughter boards attached to it. It's held inside the main body of the player on metal brackets which engage with plastic clips. Of course, when I tried to remove it from those clips, the clips broke. I've taken the board out of here, I've disconnected it from the large ribbon cable, I now have it in front of me, and I have the diagnosis. There's not a lot of kind of troubleshooting, but this is an excerpt from the user manual, and I've kind of blown this right up, but we have here IC612, which is described as mechanism control. So I think that's the one that we're interested in. There are some test points on it, and the test points then correspond with another sheet that I have here which has some waveforms on it. So what we're going to try and do is try and get the oscilloscope down here and look to see if these waveforms uh, on these test points look anything uh, like they're supposed to. So I started to remove the daughter boards in order that I could access the mech control processor and take a look at connections between it and the other connectors on the board. As I did this though, I spotted a bulging capacitor. So I cleaned up around it. Let's find out how that went. All right, so unfortunately the news isn't good. I took a look around this capacitor and in fact, there's quite a few of the tracks have been damaged, presumably by this corrosive electrolytic. All of these brown caps are kind of suspect, but more worrying is these damaged tracks. And there's, as I can see, four or five or maybe more of them already. And honestly, Given the state of the plastics, given the state of this board, I'm not sure that it's going to be worth spending too much time on this. I think maybe we just have to draw a veil over this one. So I must admit to taking a little bit more time away from the repair of the laser displayer. But then I thought, no, I'm not going to give up. So I set about removing the suspect capacitors and cleaning up the board. I've got all my capacitors out now and what I'm going to do now, and all of them, but all of the ones that I have chosen to replace, I'm going to look around this area here where they have leaked. So I cleaned off the board and what I found isn't good news. There was quite a lot of damage from the electrolyte that had leaked from the capacitors. And I don't know if you can see, but there's a number of areas on here where there are breaks in the PCB tracks. These tracks run between the mechanism control processor and the connectors on the board which then in turn connect that processor to the various sensors and motors that control the mechanical components of the player. Now I've never repaired printed circuit damage on this scale or where the tracks were so fine and so close together. Perhaps worse than that, I don't have a microscope. So I set about doing the best I can repairing the tracks with some copper wire. The wire I have is enameled and 0.2mm in diameter. That's not much thicker than a human hair, depending of course on how thick your hair is and what part of your body the hair came from. So since I didn't intend the wire to contact any tracks other than those I was intending to repair, I cleaned off the enamel of a section, cut it to length and held it in place on the track using Kapton tape. I then applied flux and soldered it in place. Once the solder had cooled, I cut off any excess with a scalpel and moved on to the next track. All of this was far too intricate to capture on my video camera, so I've cut in some still images to show the eventual results. Now I think I have all of the tracks repaired. I'm just going to test them with my multimeter on continuity and check that everything's connected up as I would hope it would be. So I'm satisfied now that all of the tracks are intact and what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean them up with a little bit of IPA and I'm going to cover the exposed tracks with a little bit of nail varnish. Now I suppose you should use solder resist or something like that. I don't have any of that. I do have some nail varnish. Well I bought it just for this purpose. I didn't happen to have some nail varnish and I'm going to use that just to cover up the tracks and protect them. I did check it to make sure it is not conductive. I put a little bit on the board here, measured it with my meter and it's not conductive and there's no metallic particles in it. So hopefully that will be okay. If it doesn't work well, the board didn't work before, did it? So, you know, I guess overall I'm no worse off.
And now that's all done, I can replace my capacitors. And here they are, a little bag of them from a UK electronics supplier online. And hopefully I got enough of the right values and we'll go ahead and solder those in, in place of the ones that had failed. And here is our repaired board, or what I hope is our repaired board. So now I need to get it and everything else back together so we can try out the player. So I just want to take a second here to take a look what's going on. Now, I've come to the point where I need to reassemble the top part of the player. This is fairly important. It's a metal strip. It fastens into the plastic here and uh, it holds the disc in place while the disc is rotating. Clearly a very important function, but there's a problem that the plastics are very brittle. And here are just a few examples of some of the plastic pieces that have broken off as I've been repairing this. And to be honest, I haven't even bothered to keep them all. The problem that I'm facing is that there is a screw boss here that has completely shattered. If I tilt it, you can see that that screw boss has disappeared. So I'm just going to use some basic epoxy putty here to reform that kind of screw boss. And then I'll sink a screw into it while it's just kind of going off maybe not completely set, to cut a thread into it. I'll pull the screw out, unscrew the screw, I should say, and then hopefully that will form a screw boss. But you may have noticed there are two screw bosses here. These ones have been unused, these are used, but there is only one hole at each side. So uh, there is a hole for a screw boss and a hole for a screw boss, uh, but then there's a dimple. So I'm going to repair this with the epoxy putty, but I'm also going to drill out these holes here where the dimples are and hopefully put a fresh screw into there so that's going to hold it nice and tight. I have a second hole drilled now. I just drilled it with a normal household drill and just that kind of filed it off a little bit which is where you see the scratches. Hopefully they line up with the second screw bosses on here and I have my somewhat clumsily repaired screw boss here but hopefully that won't have to do much of the heavy lifting because most of it will be done by the new screw boss. So I'm now going to put this back in place. So unfortunately, this wasn't the only place in the display that I had to make these repairs. In fact, I had to repair screw bosses on the front panel, other screw bosses on the top of the player, some underneath. The list just goes on and on. And the plastics in this player now are so brittle that there's no way I could realistically sell this on as a working player. It's going to have to go for parts. So at this point, the video really becomes a resurrection more than a restoration video as we're giving this player its one last hurrah before it has to go to its ultimate death. In the meantime, I need to do something to secure this electronics because it's flopping around like crazy as I'm trying to work on it because the original things that held it in place, like the other pieces of plastic, have all broken. It does have a little plastic foot on which will hopefully keep it from the bottom enclosure when the bottom enclosure is in place. I might try and put another kind of little bit of a foot or something on there, but as you can see, it's kind of falling out here. So what I'm going to try and do with this, I think, is I might have to resort to a little bit of hot melt. It's not something I'd like to do, but really this machine, we have to say, is on its last legs, isn't it? This plastic isn't going to last much longer, no matter what I do to it. And once the chassis has gone, there's going to be no rescuing it. So I don't think a little bit of hot melt is the end of the world if it gets as a functional player, at least for the time being. So the bodges on this one continue as I try to hold the printed circuit board in place using hot melt, where once there were plastic pieces. To be honest, it pains me to have to do this, but I really don't have any alternative. Even the epoxy isn't bonding well to the plastic. The chassis is cracked throughout, and really there is very little hope. This is the infrared sensor board it also has the power switch on it and as you can see it has a connector which connects to the front panel printed circuit assembly and i don't know if you can make that out but that connector has actually now it's come unconnected i think you can see that now so i'm going to try and solder those together if that doesn't work i'm probably just going to, have to put a jumper wire on but we'll try soldering it first so mercifully and quite surprisingly the soldering went pretty well so i'm going to hurriedly assemble the player now before anything else drops off it and we'll see if it can deliver one last show before its inevitable e-recycling. So, haha, it works! How fantastic! But heeding the FBI warning there, I unfortunately can only show you snippets of what this player can do.
before we finish today, one thing I should add is that actually I don't think the printed circuit board problems were the reasons for the initial difficulties we were having with the machine. And in fact, I think positioning of the cogs and cleanliness of the contact switches, which show whether the tray and the chuck are in position, are actually the real culprits as to why it wasn't working in the first instance. But clearly the damage to the printed circuit board assembly had to be repaired and was probably necessary for us to get a working machine. So that just about wraps it up for our Sony laser displayer today. But I'm genuinely very grateful for you giving me your time and I hope you've enjoyed the video today. So until next time, I'd just like to thank you so much for watching Retro Tech Repair. And off we come with a lid.